Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're speaking this morning with Elizabeth Agro, Associate Curator of Crafts and Decorative Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Her specialty is American Modern and Contemporary Crafts. Agro, who joined the museum in 2006, has a new exhibit on view, Craft Spoken Here. It's a show from the museum's collection with objects from around the world, and it's housed in the 4,000 square foot gallery in the Perlman Building. This is the first time crafts have been shown in that space, up from the corridor, and so we take this as a sign of respect for the crafts. So you chose uh, 41 objects for the show, is that right? That's correct. Where did you start? What what was your process here? What was my process? Well, uh, as you may know, we have a very um, fine collection that was that began, I guess the museum began collecting in 1945 in earnest uh, in terms of what is considered craft in terms of the contemporary definition of it. Um, I, I made a very distinct choice to make it international, which, that, which meant um, that I could uh, corral my colleagues. And I convened a, at least two meetings with my colleagues and had individual meetings with them Your as colleagues well. colleagues at the museum? At the Museum of Art. Um, so my, my colleague in East Asian, uh, European decorative arts as well, um, Indian and Himalayan, and uh, costume and textiles as well. You know, you, you want a, a, a full range of scale. There were some objects in the collection that have never been shown because of their large scale, or um, in some cases shown incorrectly. For instance? For instance, the Lana Tawney's work, um, The Fountain of Water and Word, uh, which she made in 1963. That work of art is a 13 uh, foot uh, of black and white um, knotted um, fibers. And we had always displayed it against the wall in the former craft gallery. Tawny never intended it to be against the wall. Her whole body of work was intended to be considered as sculpture, to be hung um, in space from the ceiling. And um, I felt I needed to do right by her and her work. Um, she passed away in 2007. You know, I, I'm not sure whether she was aware or, or not that we had never in installed it correctly. And so that was one of the first works that I thought I could display. And it's, it's sort of an iconic work that you see when you come into the building and you look to the left into the Pennsylvania Gallery. It is there. It's sort of greeting you and beckoning you to come in the show. But you've also included some Philadelphia regional, sure. more than regional artists. And I'm very interested in that because um, some of them well, most of them I have heard of, but then there's this woman who did this glass work <laughs> that I never heard of before, Jessica Jane Julius. Jessica Jane Julius is um, a young, uh, vibrant uh, South Philly artist, teaches at uh, Tyler. Um, uh, she defines herself as an artist that works in glass. She, she is a glass artist, but she is also thinking about how her work can be displayed in, in space as well. So her work that's in the show um, is a work I had never seen in the flesh. I mean, it was, it was a work I had seen in slide only. But I'd seen other work that she has made that is like it in a smaller scale. And this work is called Static. And it's about a recurring nightmare that she has of a vibrating three-dimensional black line that hums. And she recreates this line um, using um, glass threads that she makes by gathering up a batch of hot black glass and with a, you know with glass you, you tend to work in a team and so she has help pulling these threads to the correct width that she wants gauge and then she will break those pieces and then flame work them bend them and create they're almost like spiders or, or paper clips that are bent and misshapen and so they're able to, to hang on each other, and she's hanging, tumbling this down off the wall and spilling it out onto the floor. And it takes about 14 feet square, um, which was the space we've given her, and she worked within that space. And it was a thrill to invite someone like that, because one of the exciting things about being a curator is having the pixie dust in your pocket, to be able to, to see a, an emerging artist who has, has the goods, you know, the potential. And... Uh, by giving them this opportunity. I mean, it's a risk, but it's a wonderful feeling. Can we back up and talk sure. about space a little bit? 
Um, you mentioned something about the former craft corridor, and we know this to be the corridor that um, is near the old director's corridor. Yes. I'm not even sure that's what that's called mm -hmm. anymore. Yes, that's, no, yeah. Still called that. And there's, it's kind of a service corridor almost. Yes. There's an elevator, there's a restroom or two. Mm -hmm. So what's going on if there, has craft lost its foothold? It's lost its building? space temporarily. Anyone who knows museums knows that space for any curator, it, they, these are, it's a commodity. And craft, even though it had been collected all these, been collecting all these years, this is the first curator who's actually paying attention, who's asking to be fed at the dinner table, you know, so to speak. Um, and that space had been given over to craft for many years. But let's be real, it's a hallway, and these works are three dimensional. Timothy Rubb, our director, felt that it, it wasn't, it was a disservice to the, the field, to our collection. He felt it would be better served to put 2D work, although there is some 3D, but generally the, the, what's in there now is modern, I think it's modern art, 1900 to 1940. I think what they've done with that space is beautiful, um, but I think take that away and you, it gave me an opportunity to show what we can do. And I think in a way it helps me work out for myself what are the possibilities. It shows him and the, the rest of the museum staff what a disservice we've been doing to this collection. So in a way, now, I mean, it, it looks pretty spectacular down there. I'm very pleased. Um, now it's a matter of where are we going to go in the future. And I think these things take time. It's a matter of finding the right space and making arrangements for that space. This is not something you can do overnight. I'm glad to hear it. Me too. <laughs> Um, going back to the subject of Philadelphia, you have a lot of programming and something called the Craft Lab. So could you tell us about that? The Craft Lab, um, I consider myself sort of an innovative thinker in the sense that I, I, I'm a curator who is very much wedded to the object, and it's very much about your experience in my gallery when I install. But the thing that I also very much enjoy is, is, is having a dialogue with our public. It can't just be about me navel-gazing about a higher idea or, or something I'm trying to work out or my scholarship as much as I do adore that aspect of my work. And what curator wouldn't, let's be honest. But I think it's very important to be relevant. And I think the craft lab for me was conceived out of the idea of, of this other branch within craft, which is about the idea of the hobbyist, you know, it's, it's something that when you say the word craft, and that's why you know, we, anyone who, who is aware of what's going on in the field, there's the craft with a large C and craft with a small C. I'm not threatened by the small C. The small C, the, the, what they call themselves a, uh, uh, the hobbyists or um, Sunday, you know, the Sunday painters, so to speak. Um, but there are other words for this now, too, with people selling on Etsy and stuff. They call entrepreneurial hobbyists. There's, there's a lot of fun that's happening out there. No one should be threatened by this group. This group is celebrating the hand. It's celebrating the spirit of making. And what, what it does is it actually elevates contemporary craft in a better way, in a higher way, in the sense because it's accessible. Not everyone's going to take up a brush and paint on a canvas. That is way more intimidating than trying your hand at a simple slip stitch or an embroidery cross stitch or trying your hand for the first time uh, knitting or crocheting or knotting. I think it allows people to sort of try their hand but then look at this work of art in our collection and say, wow, that is really difficult. Um, the craft lab is a way of extending a bridge between the two communities. And, and what is the craft lab? The Craft Lab is a, a lounge, a, a sort of a comfortable seating area in the third space of the gallery, um, within the gallery, not closed off, um, sort of like you're a great room of your house. And that way you can come, uh, there, there are different ways we're programming it. Um, if you're part of a knitting circle, a quilting bee, a stitch and bitch group, whatever, you can sign up in advance with your group of, I think, is it 12 or 15 people? And you, you can get in for free to see the show and sit in the craft lab and be part. Well, you're an extension of my exhibition. I invite you um, to come and sit in the craft lab and make. Um, that's one way you can engage. There are several other ways. Um, you can just drop in with your skeins of yarn. Uh, I had a lunch break and pay your admission. Come see the show. 
and sit in the craft lab and enjoy your hour or two or three, however you wish, long as you sit, want to sit there. Then we have also on Wednesdays, we are highlighting um, various members of our staff who are talented. We have a lot of talent in this house, a lot of creativity. And so we have PMA Art Star Wednesdays. Um, we are in the afternoon from 1 to 3. Um, you can sign, you can just come and drop in and see Lance Pauling are in finance doing embroidery, for example, or Christina Hogland from Costume and Textiles teaching simple stitching techniques. On Thursdays, we've aligned ourselves with um, the wonderful gallery in Northern Liberty's Art Star. So we're extending our you know, com to community to the region and having those talented makers come on various Thursdays, one to three, um, and anyone who, who likes a certain maker can come and see their favorite person make, whether it's a felted animal head for your wall or jewelry or knitting or any sort of embroidery. Um, there are different sorts of aspects of making. So that's also going on as well. So are you going to be sitting in on any of these sessions? Are you, are are you, you came I'm going to learn a lot. Learn? I am not a knitter, but I am embarrassed to admit. But I am I'm going to try my hand at a lot of different things this summer. I think it's a great opportunity. The curators, we need to get our hands a little messed up in the sense of trying to understand how to make various things, and I'm looking forward to it for myself, personally, and I think... Um, you don't stitch, either? I sew. I do sew. I have a sewing machine, but, um, and, uh, but, but I think it'll be fun to, to engage with these different makers um, as well. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, we have hand knitting, but, you know, these days a lot of craft objects are made on the computer. That's true. Is there a presence of that in the show? There isn't a presence of that on the show, that, except for one object that represents that, and that is the work of Doug Bucci, who is a jeweler who works in uh, CAD CAM, which is a software that allows him to build, design his object in that format. Then he's able to send it um, to various, there are various printing labs throughout the country and the world, for that matter. And he chooses his material, and they print it for him. Um, and it's a 3D printer. The piece that's in the show uh, is a, a necklace, interlinked necklace. The design of it is based on um, the cell structure of diabetes, which he's a, a lifelong diabetic, and he takes the information from his insulin pump and has figured a way to download that information into the program. So it basically represents him on various days um, in terms of the state of his uh, health. Which is very interesting, which, which in a way it goes very much along with today's society and Facebook and the idea of us putting out too much information. Here he is sort of showing his current state. Um, the necklace that's on view is, is bone white. Um, it represents death. It's very pallid. That immediately puts that object into, um, into the world of concept. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I'm wondering how you were thinking about concepts in the work itself when you were organizing this show. There's always been an argument that you, well, one thinks of, of craft being you know, things that are functional. Um, but there's a lot of concept behind a lot of the work. I mean, Lenaw's work is about word and, and voice. And the, the one theme throughout the show, that the title, Craft Spoken Here, says many different things for me in terms of what I'm trying to convey. It talks about a language. A, a nonverbal language that all these objects have, and, and what is the basic foundation of them all? Line um, is, is what I'm talking about in the first gallery, essential elements. The, the second gallery is called shape shifting and has to do with stacks and um, folds, and the third gallery has to do with gesture. But you know, Jessica Julius's work has to do with a nightmare that she's having, and, and that manifestation um, of that in glass. Doug is working out the issues that come along with with the having diabetes. You know, John Brooks is working out, you know, it's about a meditation in some cases with regard to his st stick chairs and or an experience in, in the south of France in a lush environment where, you know, in his other um, chair, en suite chair. Um, Rebecca Medell is, is, is about, it's a mandala. The one is about a prayer. Can you talk a little bit about the Critical Craft Forum on sure. Facebook? I'm very pleased <laughs> about Critical Craft Forum. Critical Craft Forum was born here in Philadelphia. Um, I you know, had taken the job in 2006, and by 2008, it was quite apparent that there was really no place to discuss what's going on in the field, to discuss what we're all working on as curators and scholars, um, or even as artists that didn't 
take place in a um, retail environment. And I mean SOFA New York, SOFA Chicago, the ACC craft shows. As much as we love all those places and we do go to them and we see all of our colleagues there and it's a wonderful way to catch up, you can't sit down and really hunker down on a topic. The fact that it takes place under a retail environment, it, it, I'm not saying it's tainted, it's just, it's just there is no place to really talk. So I was quite annoyed, and I was complaining to a colleague of mine, Namita Wiggers, who is a curator at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland, Oregon. And Namita is my, is my um, twin. She's sort of, we were separated at birth, I, I think. Uh, she's short like I am and spunky, and, and we live the same life, just on two different coastlines. And uh, we decided that we had to do something about it, and I said, well, it has to be a critical craft. You know, so we decided it's a critical craft forum, and she had the brainchild of putting it on Facebook. All of a sudden, I think it was a year ago, something happened on the forum, like some dispute or some, something got heated, and, and all of a sudden, people were, were asking to join like, like madness. And, and I think we're around uh, 1,200 right now. It's about having the discussion, getting different points of view out there, because right now I think we're in the age of discussion which has not happened in this field. It was all very much too community-bound and too much reminiscing. You know, oh, I was there when Peter Volkus lit the flame at Archie Bray. Well, that's wonderful, and I wish I could have been there too, but, but what, what, you know, what were his thoughts truly? And, and like, he's dead, so now we have to go through his papers and figure it out and reconstruct what went down in any one of these moments. And so we're talking about the past, we're talking about the present, we're looking at the future. I'm a little passionate about this. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. So we've been talking today with Elizabeth Agro at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And thank you so much for talking to us. Well, it's, I'm really honored and tickled. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.